Hey everybody, hope you're having a great day today. Hey, point of today's video is on something that um, in the last few years I've been enlightened to and I'm putting all of this data together and I'm gonna share this all down in the description to just kind of show you a perspective that I'm seeing now with what's happened in the last 20 to 30 years around industries I'm familiar with and then what's gonna come down the road in the next 20, 30 years. I'm gonna warn you, this is a 28 minute long video, but it's because I want to walk you through the steps of progress with regulation around current generation automotive industry all the way to the future and ask yourself when you watch this, how does this impact me? How does this impact my friends, my family, my children? And then think, what can you do about it? That's the whole point of this video, enjoy. Hey everybody, hope you're having a great day today. It's a pretty cold day on Martin Luther King Day here in Michigan. We're sitting in like four degrees below zero this morning. I know my truck was struggling to start, but anyhow, hope you're doing well. I hope it's, uh, you're staying warm. Today, I wanna kinda do something a little bit different. Uh, this is a video that I've been wanting to do for a while, but I've just kinda been waiting for the right opportunity, and I sorta think the right opportunity's here. So ever since this Cummins emission scandal has un, un, been unveiled recently, I kind of wanted to talk about this a little bit more. So, so if you Google search the whole Cummins emissions recall, you kind of see some of the different videos um, being obviously a little bit biased. I'm showing three of my videos that are posted where I kind of talk about this. So if you're not aware of the situation or you haven't seen the video I posted, basically Cummins has been um, admitted or is part of some sort of defeat or basically they're not meeting emissions um, with some of their pickup trucks from 2013 to maybe 2019. I have a lot of specifics on that. You can you can watch that video to talk about or if, if you're interested in looking at. But anyhow, point of today's video is I kind of want to just talk about this situation with Cummins, but also just kind of look at the broader picture globally of what's going on in the automotive and the propulsion space of the transportation of the industry. And a lot's been taking place in the last five, 10 years. I mean, you look at where Tesla's at. I mean, they're the leader globally, the number one globally selling car right now, I believe the Tesla Model 3 globally, more than an F-Series. And now you could say, well, they don't really sell a lot of F-Series in China. They do sell some, not a ton, but that's how popular electrification has gotten. And also today's video is not a rip on electrification or not pro internal combustion engine. I just want you to kind of look at the automotive industry and propulsion industry and see if you see any trend. And then when you get to the end of this video, maybe just sit back and ask yourself, how is this good for the United States or Canada for the people? Just, just something to think about. And just to start, I've spent almost 20 years of my career in the automotive industry as mechanical engineering, designing, and a lot of the time of my career has been around propulsion and emissions for after treatment devices. And I've had a, a great opportunity to work with and for a lot of wonderful companies. It's actually been a lot of fun. I've enjoyed this part of my career. So I'm kind of looking at the rest of my career as I'm in a bit of a transformation myself, like where are things gonna be with automotive industry, it's it's not gonna be the next 20 years, it's not gonna be like the last 20. Um, there's a lot of changes that are taking place that I just don't know how that fits uh, with the US marketplace. Regardless, let's start here. So, with this whole emissions scandal, I just wanna show just a super basic understanding of emissions in general. So this is an article in all of these screens, I'm gonna share the links in the description so you can check it out, do your own homework. I'm sure I'm probably gonna butcher a few things here, but I'm just trying to show you some high level uh, talking points here. So emissions regulations, there's been a lot of emissions regulations for the last 30, 40 years, and there's more coming. But in general, this chart shows a very, a very good window in what I'm trying to show in this whole video. If you look in this picture here in 1994, you see this big gray square. That used to be, from a, from a relative size standpoint, the amount of emissions in a tailpipe coming out between NOx on this left side and particulate matter on the left-hand side. With all these emission regulations that have taken place from 1994 to 2010, you can see a massive drop in nitric oxides and particulate matter. This slide doesn't even show the emissions that is in place today and what's coming in 2027 and beyond. 
So this looks small here, but if we included 2023 today, there'd be a tiny dot here. Most of the emissions in diesel vehicles has been, um, it's been a, pretty much eliminated with uh, a chemistry set that's tied to your engine basically to help it meet emissions. This whole screen is about progress and showing the great things that have been done across the world, not just the United States, every country in the world with reducing emissions, which is great. Now, regarding emissions, you could say, well, I don't really care. I like rolling coal and black soot and all that. Okay, that's okay, whatever you're into. But this picture kind of shows particulate matter. And when you see that black soot, what's happening? Well, that stuff has an impact on your respiratory system. It gets into your, into your lungs and your respiratory and kind of shows that the different particulate matter size, it goes into different areas of your lungs and the impacts it has in the lungs. It's tied to cancer, it's tied to a lot of things. Me personally, it, I'm a big diesel fan just because the efficiency of how the engines work, they put out a lot of energy. Just unfortunately, one of the byproducts of diesels is they do produce certain types of outputs and emissions, which is worse in some cases than gasoline, which is a bummer. Now, some of the technology that's came in place in the last 10 plus years is what's called selective catalyst reduction. This is a technology that goes in an after treatment system on a diesel, and this is what's tied to, you've probably heard of like your DEF system, where you have to put like this, uh, some people call it cat pee or whatever, but you put urea in this tank and it, and it goes down in your exhaust system. This is just a real quick video I'm gonna this show you, where it kind of talks about what is going on here. This means that out of all the exhaust gas pollutants produced, only the NOx are specifically targeted and reduced. To achieve this, a reducing agent is injected into the exhaust gas flow upstream of the NOx catalyst. The agent more commonly used is known as aqueous urea. During the chemical reaction, the urea breaks down the NOx compound and then combines with these new elements to form nitrogen and water. Okay, not gonna spend any more time than that, but basically the whole idea is you're taking your hydrocarbons, in this case of NOx, and your goal is to break it apart and get nitrogen and water, which is, is not harmful. There's tons of great videos on YouTube about this. I just wanted to show you 10 seconds just to show you a clip. Now, now I'm gonna take a pivot, and you're gonna see a few of these pivots in this video today, just to kind of show you, are you seeing a trend here? Is this kind of interesting? And is Barry onto something, or am I totally crazy? Now you wanna ask, what exactly is DEF fluid? Well, DEF fluid is a mixture of 67% deionized water and urea, ammonia. You have to have some water mixed with urea because if you just have the straight urea, it won't inject correctly down in the injector and have the correct catalyst reaction. So the water is used basically as a vessel to hold the urea in place so that when it atomizes, atomizes into the air, you get a proper chemistry reaction, catalyst reaction. That's the point of the water. Then you have to ask, wow, that's, that's kind of interesting. So ammonia, who's the largest producer in the world of ammonia? China. Who's after China? Russia, then other countries, then the United States. Well, also, what is ammonia used for? Fertilizer and different products for, uh, for your crops and any, you need this. This is a very important product in, in making sure you have proper yield for your crops, for your animals, or, or for food distribution networks. So there's all these com companies in the world that are making, they're selling urea to make DEF, but they're also selling, sorry, they're selling the ammonia to make DEF, but they're also selling the ammonia used in food, the food industry. That puts a challenge on where do you sell it? And unfortunately, from what I understand, the market in the industry for diesel exhaust fluid is lower margins than selling it into the food industry. I'm not in that market, so I can't speak to it. I've just heard some people in that market tell me they prefer to almost sell it all to, to the food side because they make more money. Makes sense to me. If you can make better margins, why would you not? So then governments and stuff have to get involved in order that we have DEF so that you can drive your diesel, ve diesel vehicle down the road before it goes in a you know, limp mode where you don't have, uh, d if you don't have DEF in your DEF tank, you can't drive the truck. It'll go into um, a limp mode, but you also need it for tractors, farm equipment, mine equipment, semis going down the road. This is a very critical part for transportation in the industry. And without DEF, you're gonna basically make your transportation, food, and a lot of industries, they can't move. Well, then you ask, okay, so we see China as a leader in DEF. 
Why is China also at the center of the climate strategy? Well, number one, first and foremost, they have a massive carbon footprint. They produce a lot of, of uh, a lot of emissions into the environment through their manufacturing processes, and they don't have as maybe as strict of standards in in China as they do to the U.S. With, and you can just do a little homework on this. You can you can you can see some of the stuff they practices they do, but you can see they produce a lot of carbon footprint and emissions. So they're going to be part of that. But could there be something more possibly? Well, this was an article in 2018 written by Forbes, and it talked about seven reasons why the internal combustion engine is a dead man walking. And you basically go and you look down into this and what is the number one thing? Because China says so. Well, that's pretty interesting. Why though? Well, part of the reason why is because China does put out a ton of pollution. Their vehicles didn't in the past have as strict of emissions and uh, regulations as we did in vehicles. And they had a lot of vehicles on the road. So that's another reason why they're pushing towards electrification. But could there be more? I don't know. Here's another article that talks about the top 10 electronics exporting countries. So when you think about a product that has electronics built into it, where would you think it's made? Everybody knows. China. China's earned its reputation as world factory due to its massive electronics manufacturing capabilities. You don't see many iPhones manufactured in the United States or GoPros or MacBook Pros, or any electronics hardly. It's typically made in China or some other Asian country like that. And so, well, so they control the DEF manufacturer, Urea, and their manufacturer of electronics components and we're pushing the automotive and other industries into electrification, which ties to electronics, to the uh, electronic manufacturing industry. Now ask yourself, where has the United States had a strong industry? What have we been good at? We're pretty good manufacturers in the United States. We make a lot of phenomenal products, some of the best in the world, and we're still a massive exporter, a lot of products in a lot of industries. But one of the largest industries in the United States, not the largest, but one of the largest ones is actually automotive industry. And if you do a little research on this, the automotive industry produces almost 10 million jobs in the United States, almost a, almost a trillion dollars a year in paychecks. Tons of uh, taxes are paid by this. You can see 80% of the market share is light trucks. People, Americans love their trucks. I get it. I have them myself. And then it kind of talks about where does this money go? Well, the money goes in tax revenue. It goes into our economy. But check this out. Almost 5% of America's GDP is tied to the automotive industry. That's huge. That's a monster. Here's another, another article just talking about $1 trillion into the U.S. economy, 5% of GDP. So the United States has been a powerhouse for manufacturing for a long time for cars. I mean, Henry Ford invented the modern manufacturing process and it's been implemented and you know scrutinized and improved upon since then but he was the one that kind of started it and made it where you can make sense of it and not everybody in the world is is kind of looking at that technology and and, and embracing it globally if you take our strength away america's strength away or take away some of the gdp or a lot of jobs it seems like it would probably not be a great thing for the united states so then here's another article. So this was uh, is from uh, McKinsey and Company. McKinsey is a large consulting company like Boston Consultant. You probably heard of them. But in this whole part of this is they talk about China and there's a lot to this. Uh, I'll share the link. You can check it out. But basically on this right here in the summary, they talk right here. The shift to electrification is irreversible. Electrification in the Chinese market is ongoing and permanent. OEMs that hesitate to accept this change may become significantly less competitive over the medium to long term. That's a pretty big statement, and there's probably a lot of truth to it, which is concerning. And then you could say, well, I live in the United States or I live in Canada. How does this impact me? Well, if you buy a Ford, a GM, a Nissan, Toyota, any legacy car manufacturer, including Tesla, they sell cars everywhere globally. And if they lose a bunch of market share in the Chinese market, that's going to hurt that company's revenue for shareholders and and investors which is going to make them less profitable less chance of getting money and it's not just oems it's also impacting the tier automotive suppliers tier one to tier three this also impacts them now if we go into this slide this is where things start getting interesting 
China's not buying American cars anymore, and it's bad news for everyone except Tesla. Well, clearly Tesla is manufacturing, you know, they've got their new facility up in China and it's, it's doing really well. But Tesla is now starting to see some loss of market share. In the past few years, there's been some big OEM car manufacturers in China that has started to gain a lot of market share. And I'm going to focus today on one called BYD. And when Tesla first looked at BYD, Elon Musk kind of laughed him off. And Elon Musk is, the guy is a genius. He's a very special person and his capabilities are just unbelievable. But now BYD is taking massive market share from Tesla and every other legacy car manufacturer in the world. They've been making cars for 25 years, but they've never been seen as high quality or high value, but that's changed. Things are actually getting a lot better now. Toyota, GM, VW, and BMWs are losing business to China as the gas car age is ending. So now imagine your VW and your General Motors with the Buick nameplate. You've had massive market share in China for a long time. And in the last few years, they're losing substantial market share to BYD, to NEO, and to some to Tesla as well, but mostly BYD. That's concerning for these large OEMs. And you can kind of see Volkswagen is losing the electric car race to Tesla in China. And this is another article where CNN kind of talks about it. You can kind of go through. Now you could say, how does it impact me? Why do I really care? I just need a car to drive. Well, you also don't want to lose jobs in your country. And for what? Really, at the end of the day is what are we gaining here for this? This picture here is a great visualization to kind of talk about China's dominance in battery manufacturing. This is a great visual that kind of just shows what's called a cylindrical cell battery. And in this picture, it shows 2022 battery size market to 2027. And you can see China's growth in a gigawatt hour is almost going up 800%. Now, they're losing 8% of their market share, but who cares? They're going 800% in five years. That's insane. If you look at this breakdown, Poland's only got 6% of the market share. U.S. 6%, other 11. Fast forward in 2027, the U.S. is upped. They've went from 6% to 10%, but we're not even a serious player in battery manufacturing. Tesla's doing everything it can, but all of the raw materials, all of the ownership of the IP, this stuff is all owned by the Chinese market, the Chinese manufacturers. And then this kind of breaks it down more. I'll include this link. You can kind of check this out. This is really cool. Now it kind of talks about global vehicles uh, and lithium ion battery manufacturing for 2021 to 2025 with a forecast. As you can see here, 79% in 2021. They do lose a little bit of steam, but everybody else stays flat. Everybody. So you can clearly see China is a dominant force. Now you could say, I still don't see how this really impacts me and why be worried about this. China is extremely strategic, and honestly, it's, it's impressive. What they're doing is protecting the motherland, and they're doing a lot of great things that ensures their supply chains are vertically aligned so they can hold all the cards. It makes sense if you think about it. If you're running a business, you're running a country, wouldn't you want to hold all the cards so that you can kind of control your pricing, you can control your margins, you can do everything? This is an article by the Nickel Institute, and it's talking about class one nickel, which is what's used in one of the most expensive raw materials in battery manufacturing. And it has a breakdown here where it talks about the different regions between Africa, Americas, Asia, Europe, and Oceania. Asia owns 47% of the class one nickel. Okay, and that's important in batteries. Now, if we go into this screen, this kind of talks specifically about the Chinese auto market and the comparison of local brands, which local brands would be Chinese local brands. So BYD, Neo, Luyang, and you can see versus foreign brands. If you look, the US, Japanese, French, everybody is either losing market share or staying flat best case. The United States is losing a little bit, but for the most part holding, holding steady. But look at local Chinese growth in the last three years from like call this 32% to almost 50%, that's a 50% increase in sales for them in the Chinese market, but it's coming at someone's expense. 
the traditional legacy automotive companies out of Europe and the United States. Now, this is a breakdown kind of visualizing how much does a battery cost? Why do I even worry about this? The cost of a battery in an electric vehicle is the most expensive thing in the vehicle. This specifically talks about six different vehicles and I'm only gonna talk about a little bit of this, but if you look at the 2025 Cadillac Escalade IQ, $22,000 is the battery cost of a $130,000 MSRP vehicle. That's 17% of the vehicle cost is tied to the battery. Now GM has teamed up with LG Energy Solutions and they've got a great relationship. Uh, it's a Korean company to do some really cool stuff. Uh, and then you've got Tesla Model S, 13% of them of their sales and they're they're tied up in on the Model S with the Panasonic. And then now this is where it's interesting. Look at the 2025 Ram electric truck that's coming out. The vehicle MSRP is $81,000. The battery cost is $25,000. 32% of the cost of that vehicle goes into the battery. What else is cool in this article too, if you're interested in looking at any of this stuff, you can also see the type of battery chemistry for each one of these vehicles. You can see the battery size, you can see who they're teamed up with, and then you can also see, um, yeah, battery type, chemistry, who the manufacturer is, like in this case, CATL. But what you're gonna see in this entire screen, you're seeing uh, Korea, Jap uh, Japanese, Korea, Chinese, Chinese, Chinese. You don't see an American manufacturer for batteries in any of these. We don't have the capability in the US to make a full vertically integrated process in the United States from raw materials to the anodes to everything. The United States doesn't have that capability. So this brings me to this slide. The select committee uh, on the CCP, we've got Republicans and Democrats right now in the government teaming together to try to understand, is there an unfair situation taking place in the Chinese market where the US manufacturers and European are at a disadvantage. This article kind of talks about this, but in general, you can see there's a bipartisan effort to really be concerned with the future of automotive in the United States and what can the US do and the US government do to protect this beautiful industry and the manufacturing capability we still have left in the US. Now, I'm gonna take another pivot. So since COVID, a lot of people have probably heard now more about semiconductors. This was something no one really ever talked about, including myself. I never really knew much about semiconductors. And then after COVID hit, you start hearing about how does this impact me in life? Well, it impacts you because you find out that we don't have any capacity, hardly any global capacity in the United States. But more so, not only do we not have the capacity, we don't even have really the intellectual property or the technology even to make some of the highest level of semiconductors. Yes, can we manufacture semiconductors in the United States, but these are the technology of semiconductors that were made 30, 30 years ago that are large and they don't have the computing power that the needs of cars with ADAS systems or autonomous driving or 5G networks or all of these high computing need technology that's in healthcare, automotive, food, and, and food industry, aerospace, military, they need high level of semiconducting two and three, uh, I think it's called nanometer, uh, NM sized uh, semiconductors, which is why Biden, Trump, the entire uh, government and presidents had been involved with, this is a national security issue of semiconductor manufacturing because we have to protect our infrastructure, electrical, uh, food, water, manufacturing for automotive, military, and it's silly, but a lot of it is deemed on the microprocessing and computing capability, and you need semiconductors to do that. And you don't need just standard semiconductors, you need the best in the world. Well, who owns that? Not North America, not Europe. 80% owned by Asia Pacific, specifically TSMC. So, oops, skip the slide here. Specifically TSMC, oh, maybe I didn't actually. Skip, I went ahead. TSMC right here. So it's a Taiwan, Taiwanese company that has been doing great things and they pretty much own the entire industry for uh, some of the most premium manufacturing. So there's some fabs being uh, built currently in the United States where we can have more uh, onshore manufacturing and capability of this. We're still not there yet, but it's working towards the right direction. But then you can kind of ask yourself, how did we get to this point? And I'm not an expert in semiconductor manufacturing, but 
I'm gonna draw some comparisons of what we're seeing happen in the automotive industry is the exact same thing we've seen happen in the semiconductor industry. When the United States and Intel and other companies, maybe is it AMD, once again, I could be totally butchering this because I don't have any, I don't have a lot of knowledge in understanding uh, consumer electronics and printed control boards and any of that manufacturing, but we used to do this stuff on shore 20, 30 years ago. We got out of it because we couldn't hit the margins for shareholders and owners in the United States. So we had to go offshore to lower cost countries for them to manufacture. Fast forward in 2020, 2023, the United States doesn't have the technology in the US to manufacture. And even if we did, we can't make it and make money because Taiwan can make it at such a great price and their technologies is so far advanced. So they were able to work on this over the last 30 years and make it profitable for them, own the entire global market and have the leading technology. And now, as you can see, they own 70, 80% of the market share. So you could say, once again, how does this impact me? Well, we've seen a trend in the semiconductor industry. We've seen regulations that are initially really good, reducing pollutants. But when you start getting to a point with some of these regulations and some of these changes where you're chasing diminishing returns, does it make sense to keep pushing? Or are you making now vehicles so unaffordable that people can't afford them? Or they're unreliable? Or you push a certain technology to a certain region in the world, which also puts you at a disadvantage. And this is what we're seeing unfold in the marketplace today. Stung by EV losses, Ford planning smaller Michigan factory with fewer jobs. This was a plant that's being built in Marshall, Michigan. And now there's a lot of concerns with um, who the partnership is and then tied to maybe the Chinese Communist Party. And, and I don't wanna get into all the politics because that's not the point of this video. The point of this video is, are you seeing a trend here? Does it concern you? And do you see a global winner and a global loser? How does this affect us? That's my question is like, I'm just struggling to see with some of these changes, how is this making us better in the United States? And is it, are we just uncompetitive now? Are we just, we just no one wants to work? or our costs are too high. I'm just struggling to see the correlation of all of these changes through very strict emissions regulations, electric vehicle transformation, um, not producing enough ammonia in the US. Um, we don't have the raw materials to make an electrification, not even talking about addressing the infrastructure and manufacturing US soil. What does this mean? Does, does any of this seem odd to you? I don't know. I'm not a conspiracy theorist, not a whole point of this video. This is just sharing some things to me ever since I've seen this whole Cummins thing happen. It's been making me think a little bit like, I don't know, it's just, um, it's, a, it's a little bit odd. But anyhow, I hope you find this video helpful. If you think I'm totally off base, leave a comment. If you think I'm great and this sounds awesome, leave a comment. If you think you like it a lot, maybe like and subscribe to the channel. Anyhow, I enjoy doing this. I hope it's helpful for you guys. Have a great day.